verses 6 through 12. Now, let me just tell you, um, we, we've been out of our study on uh, the second coming of Christ, which is what we've been doing. We've, we've spent the last three weeks for Christmas and, and New Year's and such. So, so the, the first part of this message is a little bit of review, kind of bring everybody back to where we were before we jump right into the, the trumpet judgments. So just so you're wondering, are we ever going to get there? We're going to get there. Revelation 8, verses 6 through 12. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared, prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain, burning with fire, was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine. Likewise, the night. Father, we pray that as we look into this word, that you would help us see the big picture of what you are doing here in this book of Revelation. We pray, Father, that you would help us to understand these things so that we could uh, allow it to impact our own lives as we look into what you have written. We pray in Jesus' name. Well, this morning, as I had said earlier, we are getting back into our study of an event, I guess you could call it, or you could also call it a series of events that will lead up to the second coming of Jesus Christ to, to back to earth. Now, we just celebrated the season of his birth, and we saw that again, we were reminded again that he came the first time as a baby, who grew into a man, who lived a perfect, sinless life, and it culminated with Jesus, who is all God and all man, surrendering his life upon the cross for our sins. He became our substitute, taking the judgment that was due us upon himself. Now, when Jesus comes a second time, it will not be like that. He will not be coming as a suffering servant, coming to plead with men to be saved from their sin. No. Rather, he will be coming as judge. He will return to receive his right, what is rightfully his. And he will judge the world and he will scrutinize all people who will not turn to him. If people love their own sin, if they love their spiritual darkness that comes with it, that's their choice. God does not force people to be saved. But there is a price to be paid for those who refuse to trust in Christ. An eternal price. And we have been seeing uh, for, for a while now, for a number of weeks, that, that the day is almost here that Christ will return. The time to be ready for his certain return is now. A quick review of what we have already covered in this series includes a large number of signs now readily apparent that the end of the age is near, very near. These include the way that the world is coming together to form a one-world government. We even noted how this COVID pandemic is being used by the world elite to, to push this plan along. 
to get people in line. We have seen that there is now an a, a international tax that over a hundred nations have agreed on to, to form, to, to get people, again, all in the same, the same place. We also discussed a number of false prophets in the pulpits across America who are not preaching the Word of God. In many cases, this thing called woke theology, have you ever heard of that? Woke theology is, is taking the minds of, of pastors off their concern for the, 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 the needy souls and instead is putting it in a different place. On communities, getting, uh, instead of getting people ready for heaven, they're getting people to, to be concerned about more and more about the here and now, about getting equity here. Quite frankly, it's a strategy that's stupid and short-sighted. It's Satan's plan to split the church and get people to be more concerned with this world than the next world. And it's working. Now, I'm all for meeting needs. I'm all for affirming human dignity. But when it takes pastors away from setting people's eyes on getting up to heaven, getting right with God, it's wrong. Pastors are supposed to be preparing people for the next life. How is being woke accomplishing it? It's not. We also looked at the, the great falling away from the church and from the truth of the Bible, which is happening right now. And that began even before this woke stuff hit the fan. We noted that the Apostle Paul told us this would happen. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 in your notes, Paul said, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of the Lord, the day of Jesus' return, will not come until the falling away comes first. According to a Barna poll that we looked at, in our own nation, over the course of only a decade, we lost 60 million people from the ranks of committed, engaged Christians. 60 million. They walked away from the truth. That is a falling away of epic proportions that is happening in our nation. And the apostasy of this generation is setting the stage for the coming of the Antichrist. We noted how the world scene is, is also set for an attack on Israel by the Russians and with, and, and with them by a number of other nations, that mo almost all of them being Islamic. We saw the Gog-Magog uh, connection in the book of Ezekiel several weeks ago. As a part of this, we saw that during our evacuation, the evacuation of our military from Afghanistan last year, we left behind nearly $100 billion of high-tech military equipment. Seriously. It can be used now by these same groups, by Magog, by, by, by the Russians, in such an attack. I mean, what in the world were we thinking? Clearly it was human error. But you know what? Let's remember too that it was also a God thing. Setting the, in, the pieces in place for an upcoming attack. And all of those things will get Israel situated for the end times as well. And in just about three weeks or so, we're going to start looking at exactly where Israel fits in this and what's going to happen to them in the end times as we get ready for that second coming of Jesus Christ. When we get to Revelation 12, that's what we're going to do. Now the good news is, before the Antichrist comes, the church will go. Before the Antichrist comes, the church will go. That is, God will evacuate the true believers who have placed their faith in the work of Christ on the cross for their salvation. And if you have done that, if you have placed your faith in Christ and in Him alone, then, then you will be taken off this planet before the time of judgment begins. We call this the rapture, as we saw. And we spent much time earlier in this series of messages learning about and that it can happen at any moment. In, our, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, the Apostle Paul said, 
For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or who have already died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The promise of the removal of the church from the earth before judgment is found in a number of places in both actual word in the scriptures and also in type. Now look what Jesus said in, Re in Revelation 3.10. He said, Because you have kept my commands to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Jesus promised there that when the hour of, of trial hits this world, we will already be safe with our Lord. We won't be here. We also find the rapture in the Bible in type. Do you know what that means? In type. That is, we see a clear foreshadowing of, the, of this event early on in the scriptures. Before Noah's flood, flood, before the judgment from God that wiped out all the people on our planet with the exception of Noah and his family, there lived a godly man named Enoch. Did you know that the Lord took him away out of this world alive? He is a picture, he is a type of the church. Before the church, before the world is, is put into this terrible time of judgment, we will be taken up out of the world, just as Enoch was taken up out of the world before the flood. So his removal was a type, a foreshadowing of the rapture to come. Look at chapter uh, 5 of Genesis, Genesis 5, 21. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and watch this, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch was there one moment, and the next he was safe in the arms of God. It says God took him, and he did not experience death. What happened to Enoch, as I was just saying, is a foreshadowing, a type of what is coming for the church before the judgment. For not everyone who simply goes to church, but who actually trusts in Jesus Christ, those are the ones who are going to be saved. I hope, I, I earnestly pray, that it includes each one of you. Now, in our study, we have started to look into the book of Revelation, and, and the writer, the Apostle John, has, has taken us along on his vision of heaven. In chapters 4 and 5, we saw the scene in heaven, one that is still future, and it shows that Jesus will be given this scroll, this title deed to the planet Earth. And it will have seven seals holding it closed. And as Jesus tears open each seal, a, a new judgment is going to hit the earth. One catastrophic event after another. We call these the seal judgments. And by way of review, the first seal torn open will reveal the coming of the Antichrist. The second seal will cause wars to occur all over the planet. The third seal will bring famine and scarcity. The fourth will bring widespread death. Indeed, it tells us a quarter of the human population will die from a variety of causes. That's 25% of humans. If there are 8 billion people on the earth, that means 2 billion people. The fifth seal will reveal the terrible persecution and, uh, uh, and death impacting people who turn to Christ after the rapture happens. I mean, that's the good news. At least people after the rapture, are, there will still be people saved. There will be some who see the error of their ways, and, and when, when 
the church is evacuated without them, and they will turn to Jesus. The sixth seal will be a cosmic event. It is very likely going to be an asteroid hitting the planet. And the seventh seal, I guess you could say that's the worst of all, because it reveals that there are seven new judgments to come. We call these the trumpet judgments, for each one is heralded by the sound of an angel blowing the trumpet. And that is where we are picking it up today. See, I told you we'd get there sooner or later. Look at Revelation 8, verses 6 and 7. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now can you imagine this? It tells us hail and fire mingled with blood will hit the earth. Now quite frankly, I'm stumped. I don't know what that's going to look like. Clearly it is a supernatural judgment. I'm certain that in the tribulation after this judgment hits the earth, there will be scientists and even politicians who will come up with some crazy explanation for how all this happened and, and how everything is now is okay and they will call it some sort of anomaly that will probably never happen again. But the truth of the matter is, this is going to be beyond catastrophic. It says here that a fire will burn up one-third of the whole earth. This is the beginning of what they call the one-third judgments. One-third of the whole earth. Now think of it this way. It seems that every year now we see news reports about how bad the forest fires are in California and in parts of the West. Stop me if you've heard this one before. We hear it every year. In 2020, the latest statistics available, California lost over 6,600 square miles due to fires. Okay, that's a lot. That would be equivalent to the, an area 81 miles long by 81 miles wide. If you want to put it in, in context for New York State, think of from Buffalo to east of Rochester and including everything from Lake Ontario all the way down to the southern, through the southern tier right to the Pennsylvania line, and just think of all of that burning up in one year. Size-wise, it's not too far off of that. Okay, so that's huge. But this judgment that we are looking at, this first trumpet judgment that we're looking at when the angel blows, the comparison is laughable, except for the seriousness of it all. Because it tells us here that one-third of the whole earth will be burned up. And all the green grass, it says, all of it. Now, I'm unsure if that means all the green grass in those areas that are stricken with fires that lost all their trees, or if, it's, uh, or if it means the whole, the whole world. I'm not sure. But here's the bottom line. When one-third of the earth is burned up, that will be over 8,000 times more. 8,000 times more than what California wildfires took away in 2020. Let that sink in. It would be the rough equivalent of losing all the plant life in North America and all the plant life in Central America and all the plant life in South America in one judgment. Do you think the air quality in parts of the world is bad right now? Try adding that much smoke to the world because these are fires that will burn it up. Also, realize that trees and grass produce oxygen. Take away one third of that from the earth and you've got some respiratory issues would be my guess. Take away one third of it from the earth, you've got huge issues. That's just the first trumpet. God is just getting started. Now, before we go any further, though, 
Let's not lose focus on why these judgments will happen. It is not because God hates the world. It is not because he hates people. Really, it is just the opposite of that. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his own son to pay for our sins, to be our substitute in taking judgment uh, for our, the judgment for our transgressions. But still, so many people refuse to come to him for safety and blessing. They love their sin and they don't want to give it up. Now watch with this what the Lord says. Look at, at uh, Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2. God is the one, he says, I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. Now what does it mean that all day long the Lord has stretched out his hands? Well, it means that he was bidding his people, people to come to him. Come to him for safety. Come to him to find love. Come to him to experience the deepest, the most meaningful uh, uh, fellowship in the universe. Come to him to find peace and joy and to live in holiness before him. That's right. Don't ever forget that the Lord is holy. He is what he is. His holiness will always be. He is calling the people of this world to come to him in a way in which he can receive them and bless them. But when holding out his hands proves insufficient in compelling people to respond, well, then God is going to resort to something less pleasant. The judgments of revelation. Some will have their hearts softened through these judgments and flee to him as the only refuge. Others are going to be crushed in the sin that they so cherish. Their blood will be on their own hands. Their sins will be unpaid for and they will choose to die in them and they will reap the eternal consequences. But, but this is the point of the Revelation judgments. It is not God's hatred of the world is his love to draw those people who would come his love let's look at the second one verse 8 of Revelation 8 then the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now when we studied an earlier judgment, the sixth seal, we saw what appears to be an asteroid hitting the planet and widespread devastation that will follow. The, 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 that object will apparently hit the earth on the land. In this second trumpet judgment, it is clear that another piece of space debris will also hit the planet. But this one will not hit the land. It will do its damage on the seas. John says it was like a great mountain. Give you an idea how big this thing is. A great mountain burning with fire. So the size of a mountain, he says. I have to wonder if this is going to be a comet that's coming to the earth. Comets have tails that appear to be on fire. But it could also just as easily be a meteor or an asteroid. Now, by the way, there, there is a difference between an asteroid and a meteor. And it, it really doesn't make much of a difference once either enters the earth's atmosphere, because, um, uh, as as. Um, we will see. An asteroid, the difference, by the way, is an asteroid actually orbits the sun, while a meteor is a piece of an asteroid that is broken off apart from it. In both cases, when they enter the Earth's atmosphere, they get superheated by the friction of the atmosphere as it comes through, and, and, and it will often turn them into fiery missiles that can cause great damage. 
Sometimes they explode in the air before impact, and that's actually worse than them hitting the earth. On June 30th, 1908, in Tunguska, Siberia, an asteroid estimated to be about 60 meters wide, in, a, in other words, not very big comparatively to something that John's describing as the size of a mountain, an asteroid about 60 meters wide entered the atmosphere and it exploded before it hit the Earth. The explosion was over a sparsely populated area, thank the Lord, but it flattened an estimated 80 million trees over a forested area of 830 square miles. The power of the explosion was estimated to be around 12 megatons, far larger than any nuclear device that has ever been tested. Well, what is coming in this second trumpet judgment will make such a nuclear device look like a firecracker in comparison. Look again at the end of verse 8. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. This continues what we were talking about with the one-third judgments. At the sound of the second trumpet, one-third of all the seas will essentially be killed. Nothing will survive. All the sea creatures in that one-third of the, of the sea, world seas will die. Not a fish will survive in the impacted parts of that ocean. Any ships unfortunate to be uh, in, in, in the affected areas, they're going to be destroyed. If, you, if, if the comparatively smaller Tunguska asteroid could topple 8 million trees. Imagine uh, uh, what a space rock large, as large as a mountain will do. It will capsize ships. It will turn them. It will rip them by its force. So you can imagine the devastation that will happen. Obviously many will die in such a judgment. But the effects will go so much farther than do you think that we have supply chain issues today? They've been talking about them for months. What will happen when a third of all the commerce out on the ocean gets wiped out? Your Christmas shopping will be impacted. Your new Honda that you're waiting for coming over from Japan, it's going to be on the bottom of the ocean. You're going to need to read. One third of the oceans will become dead zones. The water will look like blood. It will likely be poisonous to anyone who touches it because who knows what will come to the planet through that space debris. Think of the beaches on the days and the weeks later when, when these sea creatures, small and great in size, begin to wash up on the shores. Millions, if not billions of such, will need to be taken away and buried or burned or something. When we consider these types of things, do you realize how small something like COVID is in comparison? Every day on the news right now, it's COVID this, COVID that, COVID. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to make light of COVID. I'm simply pointing out that right now it seems like such a big issue to us. But in the day of these coming judgments, uh, of the trumpet judgments, something like COVID won't make the last 15 seconds of the newscast. The coming devastation will be so much worse than our most difficult issues of 2021 and hopefully 2022. Verse 10. Then the third angel sounded. And a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Now the second trumpet we just saw was upon the oceans. This third trumpet is on what appears to be fresh water. 
again falls into this one-third judgment thing that we've been talking about, or because it's going to poison one-third of all the fresh water on the planet. And likely, it will mean that parts of the earth will become basically uninhabitable. The question is, though, what is this thing? What is this judgment? I mean, is this another meteor or an asteroid? Well, maybe. But there are some clues here that may indicate something quite different from those things. The, the name of this star is given to us. Did you notice that? Wormwood. Why does John share that fact with us? The purpose, what is the purpose of, of letting us know what the name of this thing is. Well, the truth of the matter is, it's pretty important. Let's see where this might lead. First of all, the, the word wormwood means bitter. It means bitter. On April 26th, 1986, a major event, worldwide event, happened. You remember what it was? That was the day the meltdown of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in what is now the Ukraine began. According to official records, less than 100 people died in that accident. But the indirect impact, for example, cows eating hay filled with radiation producing milk and meat that was poisoned and ingested by people, killed an estimated number of people in the hundreds of thousands due to the cancers that these tainted products cause. Do you know how the word Chernobyl is translated when we put it into the English language? Wormwood. Wormwood. I bring that to you so that we might consider what John saw and described as a star impacting a third of the waters and killing a lot of people, that it possibly could be some sort of nuclear device, a nuclear missile, perhaps a number of missiles that, that could come from above, like stars, and explode in some sort of attack, or maybe it even could be an accident. Maybe it could be a computer malfunction or, or the like. I mean, it, it really seems to me that it could be a possible fit. I think it's pretty amazing that besides the, the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan back at the end of World War II, that no such atomic or nuclear device has ever been used in warfare in this world. Man has, up till this time, corralled this sinful instinct to, to kill with these massively destructive weapons, realizing that the winds could take the radiation well past their targets and maybe even blow them back on the people who sent them. But in the end, these weapons may well be used by someone. Or God himself will ensure that they somehow go off as his judgment upon, uh, upon this planet of sinful inhabitants who will not turn to him to be saved. Let's look at verse 12. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that the third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Now on the surface, this does not seem to be as harsh as the previous judgments, does it? Just the lights in heaven going out. Nobody dying, apparently. But it, it's all about the timing. Jesus points out this out to us in Luke's Gospel. Our Lord explains what this period of the end times will be like. Look at Luke 21. Jesus said in Luke 21, beginning at verse 25, Jesus said, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, 
the sea and waves roaring. Now watch, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Same event. Do you understand what Jesus is saying here? After all that they have experienced, when men see the lights in, in the heavens flickering out, a third of them, it will scare them so badly, but that for many, it's going to be the last straw. The fear will be profound and intense. Jesus said it will cause some hearts to fail. When a third of the lights of heavens go out, no one's going to be able to explain it. And people will be deranged in their minds. You know, in the morning, we expect the sun to come up. To come up. At night, we look for the moon. And we also look for the stars, certain stars to be in certain places. What will it be like when one day those things fail to happen? People will suddenly realize that they are more adrift than they ever knew. And the aloneness that they sense will be so intense and deep that many a heart will break. Hopefully some will turn toward the only one who can fix such hearts. And that is the point of this judgment. To call people to Christ. Can I ask you a question? Is he calling you today? Or are you making him wait? Don't you wait. Why would you do that? Come to him today. I invite you to pray with me right now if you're, if you're searching for the right words. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. And if you're not sure that you're sure, then I hope that you'll re repeat these words after me and mean them. Lord, I am lost. I need you. I am a sinner. I'm unable to stop doing what I, what I know that I should not be doing. I'm unable to save myself. Save me out of my sin. I want to be yours. I believe you died for me receive you as my Savior. Let me be yours. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I hope you'll let me know. I want to help you in your growth. Let's pray. Father,